Okay, I decided I wanted to redo the big O. Uh, I just didn't like the original ex explanation I had, so I'm gonna try to do a little more thorough uh, review because I remember when I did the class, big O is a really complicated topic that uh, did not really make that much sense to me even into like my second year. Uh, so I'm gonna try to explain it in a little different way through examples. Uh, so first off, what is big O? It's a way that programmers measure the program complexity. Uh, in the case of CS1210, uh, it's just showing how many times a function does something. Uh, a more in-depth way of looking at it would be that n is some sort of size of something, right? So when we look at big O, we always are referring to some sort of n. Uh, and I think what helps first off understand what big O is, is understanding what n is. So n is just the size of the input uh, and that can mean different things based on what the function is trying to do so if it's some sort of sort algorithm uh, perhaps the size would mean how big that list is that you're trying to sort through um, in the case of the Fibonacci sequence that we did earlier that size could be the Fibonacci number that we're trying to uh, calculate so how far out we want to go in which case it is literally just n so n can be a bunch of different things but what's important is that we realize that big O represents how much the program has to do based on the size of n. And the reason we even care about big O is because it's easy to write a function and we don't really care about efficiency of that function if it just has, you know, a sort algorithm that's going through 10 items in a list. Where it gets a little more complicated is if you're working for Google or some big company has to deal with a lot of data and then all of a sudden you're dealing with lists that have, you know, millions of user data that you have to sort through and all of a sudden it, it matters a lot more uh, how efficient that code is at getting through that list which is why there's a lot of complex sorting algorithms you can find online uh, you can look up on Wikipedia that go into much more depth on uh, how to efficiently sort through code we're not gonna do that here we're just gonna <laughs> stick to the basics and look at a few examples um, so a good way of demonstrating an O N a big O N function is by looking at a for loop so big O N is what I'm going to name it here and then we're going to say in this case that N is a list of elements doesn't matter what those elements are but it's just a list of elements there's something inside of a list it could be anything and the beauty of Python is they could be any variable type um, etc uh, you get the point uh, it's some sort of list with a bunch of items in it so big O N function would just go for each item in that list uh, loop through it and then in this case we would just I don't know print the item this this obviously is more pseudocode than actual code but it's meant to give you an idea so what this is doing is basically it's creating a linear relation with how often the function has to do stuff based on the size of the list right so if we pull up our screen share whoops Okay, so if we have a list that is 10, so length of n is four, right? So how many times is it gonna print something? Well, there's four items inside that list, so the for loop is gonna go through it four times. It's gonna print each of those items from index zero to three. So four times for a list of length four. Now, if length of n is equal to five, how many times do we go through that for loop? we go through it the same amount of times plus one, right? We're just increasing n, so there's now five items inside of that list, so it's only looping through it five times, right? Length of n is equal to six. Same idea, we're going through the for loop, we're printing something six times, right, for each element inside of the list. So that is where we get the idea that this is big O n. It's because no matter how much we increase n, it's always going to be a linear relation. So, um, for ex in this case, every time we increase n, it's a one-to-one -one linear relation. So an increase in n by one is gonna increase the uh, complexity of the function, or how many times it has to do something by one. So this is a fairly efficient code because uh, it scales accordingly, right? You don't want it to get more complex the bigger the data set gets, because that means that it can take forever. And we'll actually show uh, what impact that can have on performance um, 
with the Fibonacci sequence that we wrote earlier. Jeez, my inbox is blowing up. <laughs> okay, so that's big O N. Uh, and it's important to note that there can be a constant in front of N, right? Right, so it could be big O 2 N. We don't really care about the constant because in complexity, usually it doesn't matter. Uh, and you may ask, what would make it 2 N? Well, just think about it, doing a for loop twice. So for item in N, print item. So now if we have a list that is four items long, so the length of the list is four, it's going through the for loop once four times, and then it's going through the for loop again four times. So that would be eight times, two times four. Now if that list was increased to five items, it's going through it five times once, and then five times again. So two times five is five. So basically it's taking the length of the list and then times two. So that's big O N. So what would be an example of big O N squared? Which is another common one that you'll see. I don't like that variable name, but you get the idea. <laughs> um, so that would simply be a for loop inside of a for loop. And right? And then we can look at this here and think through it logically on what's actually happening. So let's say we have a list of four elements, right? Four items in the list. So what's the first for loop doing? It's looping through each of those elements. So four times is how many times it's gonna loop. And then it goes into the nested for loop and it does the same thing again, right? So let's say that item one is first item. Uh, first item. So then it's gonna print one, two, three, four. Right, we'll, we'll just say that our list is just one of Oh my goodness, one, two, three, four, right? So it's gonna do that. So for item one equal to one, we need to print four times, right? As we get to item two, or sorry, item two is our second. Item one equal to two, we do the same thing again. We go one, two, three, four. We're just looping through that list again item three, item one equal to three, one, two, three, four, then item one equal to four, uh, one, two, three, four, right? So we had a list that was a size of four, but we've actually printed this list 16 times, right? We got four down, four wide, four times four is 16. And that's how we get big O and squared from that because it's squaring whatever the size of the input list is, right? So if this was five, it'd be the same idea. I would just add a fifth. Five, one, two, three, four, five. And all of a sudden you've used the print function 25 times, right? Length of the list times, or to the, <laughs> to the second power squared. Uh, so that is what a big O n squared function is. And you can imagine that becomes a problem when we're writing programs because it's getting exponentially bigger, or not exponentially, it's getting uh, much bigger as we go on with time, right? So that function is gonna grow. And that, that becomes a problem because when we get to a bigger list, right, it becomes increasingly more difficult to look through all those items. So that's big O n squared. So now let's go and look at an example. Let's figure out if our Fibonacci equation that we wrote in our last tutoring session, Andrew, is going to be big O n or big O n squared. So if I pull up that code here, and I'm not for sure if this is exactly how we did it in yours, but I think it's pretty close. We just want this one for now. Okay, so we got our Fibonacci function right here, right? Um, so let's just let's just put in some terms, and then I like to draw it out as a tree. It's a good way of looking at it. So let's say that we have Fibonacci of three, right? So the input n is three, and as I mentioned before, this isn't a list, but we need to think about it on how the function's running. 
and the function is always going to run twice for whatever end value input, unless it's equal to zero or one, which we won't really worry about that case. Um, so we need to remember that it doesn't matter uh, the size of a list in this in the case of this Fibonacci function what matters is how big n is so that's our size so our size can vary between functions we just have to think about what would make the function more complex well having a bigger Fibonacci number to solve for would make it more complex so let's go back to this so we got Fibonacci 3 here so what do we need to calculate to find Fibonacci 3 well we need to calculate Fibonacci at 2 and Fibonacci at one. Well, we know Fibonacci at one, that's defined, but we need to calculate Fibonacci at one now and Fibonacci at zero for Fibonacci at two. So right now we see that when n is equal to three, we have a complexity of four. There's four things here that it has to do, all right? So three and then four operations. But let's go to Fibonacci 4 and let's see how much it increases, right? Because if this is a big O, n squared, then n equals 4 should have 16 operations, right? Because we're squaring the previous one. So let's see if that's true. Let's see if this is going to be a big O, n squared. So Fibonacci 4, we go, we have to find Fibonacci 3 and Fibonacci 2. And then in Fibonacci 3, we have to find Fibonacci 2 and Fibonacci 1. Fibonacci 2, we have to find Fibonacci 1 and Fibonacci 0. Those two are good. This one's good. Fibonacci 2 has to break out, though. Fibonacci 2 and Fibonacci 1. Oops. We just did that one. Fibonacci 1 and Fibonacci 0. All right, so how many do we have here? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So for n equals to four, we have eight operations. Well, eight operations is not equal to 16 operations. So right there, we know that it's not big O n squared. In fact, it's going to be big O n. Um, in fact, to be more specific, it's going to be big O 2 n. Uh, because what's happening is it's increasing by a factor two for each n that we increase it by. So if we kept this going, fib five would have now eight times two, which is 16 operations. Whereas if it was n squared, it would be, well, it would already be 16 operations for fib four, so then it'd be 16 squared. And you can see how it gets very complex fast, so. Our uh, Fibonacci function that we've made in uh, our last section is actually going to be big O n, which is cool. But we can actually make it a little more efficient here because you'll notice there's some repetitive terms in our Fibonacci sequence, right? Like, doesn't it seem kind of redundant that we calculate Fibonacci to here and here, and then we calculate Fibonacci well, Fibonacci, and this is a bad example, but basically we calculate Fibonacci 2 twice. There's no need to do that. We can just save what we solve for Fibonacci 2 here, and then we can just access it when we have to calculate it here for this addition step. And we can do that with a different function called FastFib. Okay, so let's take a look now at Fast Fibonacci, which is basically calculating the Fibonacci number and in a different, a little more efficient way, and we're gonna see why in a second here. So here's our fast Fibonacci sequence, or function. Uh, it takes this list sequence, which will be important when we go through, and what it's really doing, if we go back and look at our Fibonacci sequence here, you'll notice that there's some terms that are, zero to this, there's some terms that are used multiple times, right? So we calculate the Fibonacci sequence here at two, and we also calculate the Fibonacci sequence here at two. So we calculate Fib two twice. So what if we could just store the result for this in some sort of list and then access it again here instead of recalculating the whole thing? Because then we could get rid of this whole step entirely and really simplify our, our code. So 
we can do that by creating this sort of list here. Uh, the initial two terms are zero and one, right? Which is the Fibonacci at zero and the Fibonacci at one. And then what we do is every time we calculate an additional term, we just add it to the sequence list. So that's what's happening here. We're saying if n, which is the Fibonacci number we're trying to compute, is less than the length of the sequence. So we're saying, is that Fibonacci number already computed and is it in our sequence list? If it is, aka if n is less than the length of the sequence, so the index exists, is what we're really checking for there, then just return that number. There's no point in calculating it again, it's already in our sequence. But if it's not, then what we need to do is we need to go and calculate the Fibonacci number for that n. And then once we're done calculating it, let's just go and add it to sequence, because why not? It's super easy to do. So we'll add it to the sequence, and then we'll return the temp fib. That way, if you're calculating the fast fib at four, it's gonna have to calculate the fast fib at three and the fast fib at two multiple times. So they've already been calculated once and then you can just access it again and again. Um, if we go back to the example, it's great because you can really just get rid of this whole term entirely. There's no need to calculate fast fib two again if you've already done it. And now all of a sudden we have a much easier piece of code to look at here, complexity wise, right? So now we only have one, two, three, four, five, six terms. And if we go and we look at how that affects our fib at five, we have fib four, fib three, fib two, Fib one, fib two, or sorry, one, fib zero, fib three, fib two, fib two. I'm just going to abbreviate it. <laughs> fib one, fib one, fib zero. You get the idea. Fib one, fib zero. But because, so we go through here, right? Go down the tree. We calculate fib two right here. So now we can remove all other fib two calculations because we no longer need to calculate them. So we can remove this guy. And we can remove this guy because fib two is already calculated. We can just access it from that sequence list that we made. And then we go here and we calculate fib three. Now fib3 is calculated, so we can erase all other instances of fib3. So we got it over here. Oop, it's gone. And then fib4, we still have to calculate. And then that gets us fib5. All right, so now what's our complexity here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Fib5 took six operations. Fib four took one took one, two, three, four, five operations. So we still have O big O N, right? But it's no longer big O two N, because that's what we had before. Now we just have a linear relation. There's no factor or multiple on it. Because before what was happening is every time it increased by one, the thing increased by a factor of two. But in this example, we are literally just increasing it by one, the complexity, right? So we added uh, one to the n term, and we added one additional operation that we had to do to calculate that Fibonacci number. So we can actually see an example here, uh, just how much more efficient that makes our code. So if we go and calculate the Fibonacci at 50, it's gonna take a while. So see, it's still loading, loading, loading taking its time <laughs> computers really thinking and it's still going right like we have, we still have not computed the fib at 50 in fact I don't even know if it'll compute in a reasonable time I might just have to end it I might kill it but if we go to fast fib here and do 50. Boom, it's calculated that fast. 
That's a lot faster. All right, let's do fib 20. Okay, that one's too short. <laughs> fib 30, maybe? Mm, starting to chug a little. Fib 40, how about fib 40? It's really thinking about this one. And basically the point I'm trying to get at here, right, is as a that two n still plays a pretty big role in it. It's just n squared would obviously be a lot bigger. And that's another thing too. It's important to note that the biggest term in your function is what's going to take precedence. So for example, what I mean by this is if we go back to this example here, let's say we add our two list again. We combine the two functions, right? So this portion right here has a big O of n. But this guy right here has a big O of n squared. Right? So what is going to be the big O of this function? It's going to be big O n squared because big O n squared grows a lot faster than big O of n. So this is going to take precedence over this guy right here. Uh, and likewise, big O of 2n would take precedence over big O of n, but like I said, you don't really usually worry about the constant in front of the big O of n. You're mainly just seeing, is it a linear relationship or not? Uh, I just wanted to make across the point with the Fibonacci and the fast fib that the constant that it's multiplied by still does play an impact. So when you're designing efficient code, it still is important to look for that. Um, so that's a short summary over what big O n is, what you're looking for. Uh, and I hope that helps.